this was also the week where um, Vladimir Zelensky, the good Vlad uh, of Ukraine, spoke in front of the United States Congress, which was pretty unprecedented. Honestly, uh, this does not happen often. The other times I remember foreign leaders speaking on Congress in the Congress uh, was when uh, Netanyahu was invited by fucking Republicans to speak during the Obama amazing. administration and was like, um, we all know he was born in Africa. You know what I mean? He was just the most racist shit. Yeah. Um, so, which is a rare look for Netanyahu. Yeah, exactly. Usually he's, you know, incredibly Super progressive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's the most progressive really. No. So uh, he spoke to Congress he, um, I wrote something for this, people. Um, former comedian Vladimir Zelensky spoke to the U.S. Congress in a pretty unprecedented address. He wore a brown sweatsuit and spoke with a thick accent, but he kind of crushed it in a whopping 28-minute address uh, that honestly, for a set, had, like, more clapter than, like, real laughter, you know? And, like, as a comic, it's like... It's like a bringer show where you brought your family. Totally. <laughs> A little bit of a bringer show vibes, but that's okay. Uh, it still was a good set. Um, he talked about the Ukrainian resolve to win the war. He talked about their sacrifice. He thanked uh, Congress for money, basically. It was like, this is well spent. Do Basically, like, don't even for a moment think that we are not grateful and this is not well spent. And he kind of had that Ukrainian, like, look you in the eyes and be like, I will fight for my country until my very last breath. And you're like, I've never felt that way about anything ever. Yeah. Definitely By the not way, my country. Could you give me some money to get new clothes? Yeah. <laughs> I only I'm... have one outfit. <laughs> <laughs> but the part that I that struck me, and I think that is the most interesting to talk about, is when he kind of he spoke about this war in a way I don't think we've heard anyone speak about it. Certainly not President Biden speaking about this war as kind of like a, a battle for democracy, a battle for what kind of future do we want? Do we want a future where um, countries can invade their neighbors and they just kind of take them over? And do we want authoritarianism? Do we want the likes of Vladimir Putin or do we want like democracy, international cooperation, you know, the prospect of joining something like, the EU or NATO, I mean, NATO is a military operation and I have very conflicted thoughts about it, especially anyway. But so it was an interesting moment and I kind of just want to play it for you. It, it was moving and we could talk about it. This battle cannot be frozen or postponed. It cannot be ignored, hoping that the ocean or something else will provide a protection from the United States to China, from Europe to Latin America, and from Africa to Australia, the world is too interconnected and interdependent to allow someone to stay aside and at the same time to feel safe when such a battle continues. Our two nations are allies in this battle. And next year will be a turning point I know it, the point when Ukrainian courage and American resolve must guarantee the future of our common freedom, the freedom of people who stand for their values. How great would it have been if Pelosi just ripped up his speech? <laughs> it's like in a move, in a just a goodbye forever move. <laughs> just, I'm done. I'm oh, hammered. What? Oh, it did, it only worked at one time? Yeah. Fuck you, AOC. You told me this would work again. <laughs> I Fuck will you. make a coat from you. <laughs> yeah. um, Nearly have a hood. Um, yeah. He's so a, he's a great speaker. He's a great. I mean, he. You know, you. There is no doubt that he is like a sympathetic and um, engaging figure. I mean, my issues do not even necessarily lie specifically with this, but it's like the. American government and the American military system cherry pick where they want democracy, where they choose to highlight uh, problems and where they choose to ignore or even fuel fires for problems. Yes. And so it's or make like things the, worse. <laughs> yes. I mean, we, we do not support democracy in many countries. If you look in South America, we despise democracy when mm -hmm. it comes to countries that have oil. We reject their democracies all the time. Yes. So 
you know, I who have oil and want to keep the money from the oil. We're great with them yeah. having oil as long as we get the money. Yes, and the that's oil. what I. Should, yeah, for sure. <laughs> like you can do drugs as long as I can hold the bag. Yeah. Um, so you and know, that's what people have have been pointing out, and they've been pointing out this whole time, and especially I think progressives and the left, if that has a meaning, but is that hypocrisy? Um, and and also the ways in which Ukrainian refugees have been welcomed with open arms, and it is not lost on anyone that they are white. Uh, and it is important to know that while he calls out the rest of the world, a lot of Latin American countries have not been really supportive of this war, have not thrown down with Ukraine um, necessarily. They've been kind of honestly a little bit on the fence. And I, you know, it is important to point out Russia for all their problems, they were giving their like kind of crap vaccine out. Um, they were handing that out. I think they charged for it, but they like gave this Sputnik vaccine to Latin American countries very, very soon after they had developed it in 2020. The United States, Pfizer, uh, fucking uh, Moderna, you think they got any vaccines? Hell fucking no, they got vaccines. They did not give vaccines. The United the United States leading on that research, that, that, that research did not benefit the health and well-being of Latin American countries. So there is, you know, I'm not saying Russia is like, a god in in the minds of Latin Americans or 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 African nations, but there's more soft power. There's and less like we're just gonna put a base in your fucking country, and uh, yeah. you're gonna be safe, right? So that stuff adds up. That that over time, you you know that is how I mean th these things add up, and future generations will be like, you know, Russia did this, and if you say Russia is a villain who we sh who should be despised. Don't leave the lane where they can do these sort of things. Right. So Juan Cole, who's been on this show before, uh, had pointed out um, this exact thing. Virtually no country in Africa, Asia, or the Middle East has rallied to Biden's cause of defending Ukraine. The lack of enthusiasm has many roots, but one of them is a strong sense that the U.S., as Gareth mentioned, is not principled on this issue and is merely pursuing a narrow national interest. They do not see Washington as actually upholding the rules-based international order, and they are correct in this assessment. And it's part of a larger piece where he argues that uh, the Syrian, former Syrian Golan Heights, annexed by Israel, just uh, who, what? I'm sorry, United States has nothing to say about that, does not pressure Syria around that, does not uphold international law when um, belligerent nations want to invade their neighbors um, and annex their territory. We're sort of mum on that, and especially when it comes to Israel. But to weigh in on this, and particularly that th this dance we do, where we want to defend, uh, you know, Ukrainian human rights and against an authoritarian like like um, like Putin, but also all of these contradictions. The United States being that person, you know, that that entity to give all the money and weapons is Max Elbaum, member of a student member of Students for a Democratic Society, now on the editorial board of Convergence Magazine the author of Revolution in the Air, 60s Radicals Turned to Lenin, Mao, and Che, and the newest book, Power Concedes Nothing, How Grassroots Organizing Wins Elections, which is out right now. Max, welcome to the program once again. Thanks. Nice to be here. Interesting listening to you to dissect modern politics. <laughs> that sounded like, a, like there was a little shade there. Like, interesting, uh, you guys trying to dissect modern politics. <laughs> <laughs> now, no, but truly, Max, you as someone who I've looked to for many years on these issues, especially in foreign policy, and I know that's not what the book is about, but what is your take on Ukraine now going into almost a year of this war and the United States' support for it and this, um, I think, our honest reactions about like, man, how much more money are we going to fund this war while we still can't get COVID funding in this country? Uh, no, I meant I meant my comment sincerely. I think you've pointed out in the course of the last few minutes uh, what a complicated and contradictory situation we're facing here. I mean, this this war, it's a human disaster and it's a global political disaster. Uh, and there's no simple ones. And there's also we're living in a world where there's not pure good guys and pure bad guys. It's the, 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 this is the, you know, the American way of thinking about things that something is all good, all bad. That's not going to fly in this right. situation. So obviously Zelensky is tapped into 
you know, you have to put ourselves in the situation of people who live in small countries that have been uh, bullied by larger countries for generations, for centuries. Uh, there's a certain uh, sense of uh, na their national or community interest uh, and that deserves to be respected. And they don't want to be pushed around anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And Zelensky is an excellent spokesman for that part of the Ukrainian uh, position on this, which is we've been pushed around and we're not going to be pushed around anymore. And we're going to stand up for ourselves and we're going to take help from wherever we can get it because we're mm -hmm. fighting a war for our national survival. That's a very compelling narrative. And to the extent that that's what the narrative is, that's fine. I agree with mm -hmm. that. We should support mm -hmm. that. But there's plenty of other parts of this that then that leaves out if it's only seen through that prism, which is right. the other part. We do live in an interconnected world. He's absolutely right about that. And this war is going to make more. We, we live in a world where wars create global disasters. This one has created a global food disaster, a global climate change disaster. And it's given the hegemonic imperial power, the United States, an excuse to wrap itself in the guise of being for peace and democracy, just like you all just pointed out, the level of hypocrisy, when on a global stage, uh, the United States is certainly as much responsible or more than anyone else of preventing international cooperation around fighting climate change, around dealing with global pandemics, around dealing with the tremendous economic inequality, vaccine apartheid, uh, mm -hmm. and all the hypocrisy. The problem for the US left right now is we're not a player in this. I mean, we can fight with each other all day about how much to emphasize how bad the Russian invasion is, how much to emphasize the problems of the US military industrial complex and what the US is using as an excuse, uh, wrapping itself in the justness of the Ukrainian cause to justify all kinds of unjust behavior in many other parts of the world, uh, including its own ambitions in Eastern Europe, uh, which are not for the good of the Eastern European peoples, although it's understandable why at this point, a lot of the Eastern European peoples, not just in the Ukraine, uh, look to the West because they've been mm -hmm but they've been bullied uh, from the East over the last uh, few decades or centuries. So right. we're, we're in a pretty difficult situation. And as you were talking about in terms of the electoral arena, the amount of power that we have and the amount of coherence that we have to exercise what power we do have is quite limited right now. Right. So our problem, is, our problem is how to get to the point where we're a player again. Uh, we, we're a player on some issues, on so-called domestic issues. We actually are a player. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the alliance right now that exists between Bernie and the squad and the Biden people, which is real and has actually mm -hmm. affected politics, there's some weight that the left has exercised through that. And totally. you pointed out to the limits of that weight with the omnibus bill and all kinds of other things. But it's a real force. It's not an accident that Biden's people talk to Bernie's people every week. And there's a measure of coordination. It's not all mean shit. That's part of it. Yeah. But they worked out a deal. Uh, and that's a partly a reflection. The deals always reflect uh, the balance of force. What's going on, Frantifa? If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel right now. Hit that button. And also, you can become a patron and support the show every single week. Get access to bonus episodes and exclusive merchandise. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. Do it.